I'm Corey Rosen, and I'm the director of the National Center for Employee Ownership. We are a private, nonprofit, membership-based information organization located in Oakland. And our purpose in life is to provide objective, reliable information about broad-based employee ownership plans. We're not about trying to help executives get more wealth, although I do want to say that I have, after a great deal of reflection and thought, found a solution to the problem of excessive executive compensation. Even Business Week now worries that executives are taking home too much pay, 500 times the average pay of a, an employee in large companies. And so what it occurred to me is that since nobody actually can spend that much money in a lifetime or their kid's lifetime or small nation's lifetime, that what we might do instead, if in fact this is not about being able to consume the hundreds of millions of dollars, but rather to be ranked as the highest paid executive, is that we reduce their pay to, say, 50 times what the average worker would make. Take the other 450 times and hire professional adulators. And these would be people who would sing the praises of the CEO. They would be dramatists and artists and uh, musicians and sculptors. And we would have these magnificent edifices our grandchildren and their grandchildren could visit just as we go visit the grand palaces and museums that were built to adulate the great princes of a time past. We would abolish the NEA because there'd be so much work for these uh, artists now. And, of course, employees would be a lot more motivated because these adulators would make it clear to the employees just how truly exceptional these CEOs were. And I have to say that although we even got this published in the San Francisco Chronicle, I've yet to receive a call from any of these companies saying they'd like to implement this proposal. So giving up on the idea of solving excess excessive executive pay, we focused instead on the idea of trying to find ways to broaden ownership beyond just the top few. In society today, about 1% of the population owns more than 50% of the privately held productive capital. If you filled up the football stadium over here with the richest people in America, those families would own more than the gross national product of over half the countries in the world. Now, that concentration of wealth is, on the one hand, something that a lot of economists say, well, so what? Who cares? Don't worry about it. That's just the way it is. If people can know that they can get that rich, it's a motivation for them to go out and accumulate more money and to build businesses and to take risks, and that's what capitalism is all about. And we shouldn't worry about what this disparity is as long as the total levels of capital are high. And indeed, we've preached that message aggressively around the world. But we're beginning to see that that's causing some problems. And indeed, again, even the more conservative business publications are starting to worry that maybe this excessive disparity in wealth accumulation, not just in our countries, but in a lot of the market countries that are moving towards capitalism, undermine support for the basic system. If people think it's essentially unfair, then when people can vote, after all, with their feet or at the ballot box and it's one person each, not one dollar each, you may get a very different result from what the market would preach. Now, back in the 1950s, an economist and investment banker and San Francisco lawyer, Louis Kelso, was thinking about this problem long before too many other people were thinking about it, other than Marxists who were thinking about it in a very different way. Kelso was by no means a Marxist. In fact, he thought Marxism was a pretty stupid idea. But he also th looked at what he thought was going to happen over the next 50 years or so, and he said, we're going to have more capital investment in the next generation than all of the generations that have preceded it combined. We're going to have more technological change in the next generation 
than all the generations that have preceded it combined. And what's going to happen is that a lot of the jobs that now provide people with relatively good pay at relatively low skills, if you're willing to work hard, are going to be replaced by capital and technology. And the jobs that get created are going to be increasingly service sector jobs that don't pay very well. Now, in the 1950s, people didn't envision that globalization would play the role that it does. But now even jobs that might otherwise pay well, because they are fairly high-skilled jobs, are being exported abroad to places with lower labor costs. So what's happening is, as Kelso predicted, that there'd be downward pressure on wages, while at the same time, investment in capital would show soaring returns. From 1973 through 2003, the median adjusted income in the United States for inflation, the median income went up 0.3% per year. But during that same period of time, the Dow Jones average went from having three digits to five. So if you were invested in capital growth, you did quite well. And if you weren't, you didn't do very well at all. Now, Kelso said the problem that we're going to see is that people are going to say, this is not fair. I can't make ends meet. I have trouble sending my kids to school. I have trouble paying for health insurance. I have trouble supporting my retirement. Government, do something for me. And the government would respond. And when the government responded, it would take money out of the economy, and that would slow the economy down. So you'd have this inevitable tension between policies designed to create more fairness, more equity in the economy, and policies designed to create more growth. And I think if you look now at what's going on between conservatives, liberals, Democrats, Republicans, that's a pretty fair way to characterize that divide. So Kelso said the answer, obviously, is somehow for employees to get a piece of that capital ownership. Now, the traditional approach is that if people want to become owners, what do they do? They save their money, and they buy stock. Well, great idea, except if wages are stagnant, but consumer needs keep going up, because consumer needs always keep going up. We need bigger houses. We need bigger cars. We need cable television. We need cell phones. We need computers. We need all these things that we didn't need in the 1950s, and we were quite happy without them. So all these costs go up, but our wages don't go up, and so we don't have the money to save. And in, indeed, savings rates are now negative. So that's not going to work. What else can you do? Well, you can have special talents. You can be a Bill Gates. You can go to Stanford Business School, and you can be an entrepreneur, and you can build a business, and that's great but it's a very small percentage of the population that's going to have that kind of ability. Now, of course, the best choice to make is choose your parents wisely. Now, a lot of people here, for instance, maybe did make that choice. A lot of people didn't. But overall, in the population, most people make a terrible choice. So if none of those work, then what are you going to do? And Kelso's solution was, somehow the workplace needs to transfer ownership to employees. And the mechanism he created was something called an Employee Stock Ownership Plan, or ESOP. And that was the first <coughs> effort to create this ownership plan that would be for all the employees, not just for a few. And I won't go into all the gory details of how this works. But essentially what an ESOP <coughs> is, is an arrangement in which a trust fund for employees can borrow money to buy shares in the company. And the company pays back the loan. So the employees don't buy the stock. The company buys the stock for them. And there are a variety of tax benefits to the employer for being willing to do that, while the employee doesn't actually have to put up any of the employee's own money. And in fact, in 1998, Congress did something that I still rub my eyes about. I've been doing this since 
the late 1970s. In fact, I used to work on Capitol Hill and was working on drafting some of this legislation. And my friends and I would get together and we'd say, well, if we ran the world, what would it be like? And we'd say, well, we would say that a business that was 100% owned by its employees would pay no federal income tax. And then we laughed because that was just a totally ridiculous idea. And today, that's the law. 1998, Congress said, that's great. So all these tax benefits to encourage companies to do that. Why, you might ask, would Congress ever do such a thing? It sounds like some sort of utopian vision straight out of our friend Karl Marx. Well, in fact, employee ownership is the one thing that all three Jesses have come to agree on, Helms, Jackson, and Ventura. For the Republicans, this is really cool. You mean we're going to create lots of people who own stock? We know what people who own stock do. They vote Republican. We love more capitalists. And the Democrats said, this is great. We've been looking for a way somehow to create a more equitable distribution of wealth. We're not getting it done through the government. We're not getting it done through taxation. Here's a way we can use the enterprise system itself to do it. So these employee stock ownership plans started to get established in the 1970s. And today, there are about 10,000 plans covering 11 million employees. Some of these companies are very large. Companies like public supermarkets, for instance, with 125,000 employees is entirely owned by its employees and has been for a long time and consistently rates not just as a top consumer-approved supermarket chain in the United States, but often is considered the best for customer service of any kind of company in the United States. The Wall Street Journal used to publish this every year. Science Applications, a company in Southern California, 42,000 employees. In the late 1960s, Bob Beister, who started the company, thought that, gee, you know, it's not really fair for me, even though I started this company, it's not really fair for me to own all the stock. And in fact, I think if I could get other people to be owners in this company, they'd have the same motivation I do, and they'd help this company to grow. So within the first year, he owned less than 10% of the stock because he'd given away the rest of it to his employees. When he retired a few years ago, he owned less than 2% of the stock, but the company wasn't a company of a handful of people. It had 42,000 employees. It was worth billions and billions of dollars. And he ended up just where he thought he would with a smaller piece of a much, much bigger pie. Part of that's through an employee ownership plan that I just described. Part of it's through other mechanisms of employee ownership I'll talk about in a minute. Most of these companies, though, are closely held companies with 20 to 100 to 1,000 employees. They're the manufacturing company out in the industrial park. They're the engineering and consulting company in the office park. They're everyday companies closely held where the owner of the company typically is thinking about retiring, or maybe it's multiple owners and one of them is thinking about it. And they'd like to get part or all of their ownership sold in a way that A, is tax advantaged, and B, keeps the identity of the business going. That this business that they work so hard to build doesn't just get sold to somebody else, and the people who worked with them and helped build it they may not have a job. The identity of company is lost. And so this becomes a very attractive mechanism for providing for business continuity. Now, as these ESOPs grew through the 80s and 90s, research started to be done on how's this doing? Is this worth the public investment? Turns out it's actually not very expensive in terms of tax benefits. But still, there's maybe one and a half, two billion dollars in tax costs going to this. And these days, that's not much money. As Bob Dole said uh, back in the 1980s, a billion here, a billion there, you're starting to talk about money. So we're just starting to talk about money on that. Well, it turns out there's been a huge amount of research done. We talk a lot about it in this book we published through Harvard. And what that research shows is that, in general, employee, on, employee stock ownership plan companies grow about 2 to 3 percent per year faster than you would have expected them to grow if they didn't have a plan. What we did in this research 
is we said, let's look at how these companies were doing relative to their competition. Let's say they were here, and their competition was here. So they were good companies. But then they set up their ESOP, and they moved up here. So what we're looking at is this difference. And that difference was about 2 to 3 percent per year faster. When we looked a little deeper, we said, well, probably some companies doing better than others. And we found that when we looked at all kinds of things, we looked at unionization size, industry demographics, were your employees uh, more educated, were they higher paid, were they more senior, all kinds of things that you might think would affect this. None of them did. None of them were related, except for three things. One was how much ownership employees were getting each year. Symbolic ownership doesn't get you very far. The second was how effectively the company communicated that the company was employee-owned. But the most important was how participated the company was in the way it was managed. Did they have teams? Did they share financial information? Did they get employees involved in day-to-day -day decisions? And those companies were growing about 8 to 11 percent per year faster, whereas the companies with very top-down management were actually growing more slowly. So people have said, well, gee, Corey, what you found was it's important to give people a sense of ownership at work, an ability to have more control over the job that they do. And yeah, that's true. And they said, well, if that's the case, then what do you need to actually share ownership with people for? It's expensive, and you don't have to give that up. It's yours. Well, it turns out that companies that do that, and certainly there are a lot of companies that do it. If you go back to the 80s, we had quality circles, then we had total quality management, then we had re-engineering, then we had matrix management, we had learning companies. I'm not sure where we are today, but each one is about three years. And then it disappears because employees say it's just a fad and it will pass. You can wait it out. Because there really isn't anything in that for them. And what it turns out is that uh, the employee ownership plan participation programs persist and grow. Because employees look at that and say, there's something there at the end of the day for me. It's not what motivates me. What motivates me is the content of the work and the way we organize work. But if I'm going to do this, I better get something out of it. So we say that if, for instance, we wanted to give people a sense of ownership, that we'd like to take those management consultants to dinner with us. And we'd have a nice banquet in a very atmospheric place, and we'd let them soak up the atmosphere and smell the food. And in fact, we'd even help them wash the dishes afterwards. But we would only give them a sense of dinner. Well, a sense of ownership turns out to be about as effective as a sense of dinner. If anything, it's manipulative, and people don't like it. Look at the job satisfaction scores today and how dismally low job satisfaction scores are in the United States. They continue to fall. People continue to feel that the disparity in pay between them and higher levels of the company, the lack of respect and dignity they have at work, are things that really make their work experience not what they hoped it would be. So as these ESOPs became established, a respectable part of American business, in the 1980s, another trend developed, and that was technology companies who, like SAIC, when they were founded, they were founded by people who, in large measure, were pretty frustrated that the companies they had worked for and that they had developed ideas for didn't give them ownership of the company. And they said, well, when we start a company, it's going to be different. We're going to share ownership with more people. And maybe at first that was just the programmers and the software engineers or the developers of products or whatever because they thought, well, these are the key people. But pretty quickly they realized, well, who's not a key person here? If somebody calls the company and they get really rotten service, you know, I called MCI, spent 30 hours on the phone a few weeks ago trying to get my 92-year-old mother's phone service restored. Now, MCI may have a brilliant strategy now that they've 
come out of bankruptcy and their brilliant strategy isn't to pretend how much money they're making. They may have great technology, but it doesn't matter because I spent 30 hours trying to get my mother's phone service restored, and so did my sister. And finally, somebody said to my sister, a third-level manager there, you know what? If I had a 92-year-old mother, I wouldn't use MCI. Now, they may have terrific management, but the company to the customer is the person who answered the phone. So companies started to figure out everybody here makes a contribution. So these technology companies started spreading ownership more broadly. Amongst the early pioneers are companies like Intel and Cisco and Microsoft. Well, this created a problem for the companies who didn't like that idea. No, well, we don't want to share ownership with everyone. This is our idea. We'll give it to some people. We're sure not going to give it to everybody. Of course, that made it kind of difficult to get good employees when they could go to one of these other big, rapidly growing companies, and they were giving ownership to everybody. So whether you wanted to do it or didn't want to do it, you kind of had to do it. And so by the middle of the 90s, virtually every technology company was giving stock options, the right to buy shares at a price fixed today for a defined number of years into the future, to just about everybody. And that continues to this day despite discussions about changes in accounting rules, making companies pull back on that. Now as that started to happen, some other companies started to take a look at this and say, you know, if it's a good idea for them, maybe it's a good idea for us, too. People think of us, uh, we're a small chain of coffee stores in the 1980s. People think of us as not a very high-tech place, you know, coffee shops. You, you grind the coffee, you pour it into the cup, you give it to the customer, end of story. Well, Howard Schultz at Starbucks had a different idea. He said, we'd actually like these people to stick around for a while. Turnover in our industry is 300% a year. We spent a lot of time training these people, and we have a much more varied and complex product than the traditional coffee shop. We'd like these people to actually have some ideas of their own about ways that they can develop this product better or serve the customers better. We want to know what these people think. We'd also like to know what they're hearing from customers. So if we want to reduce training costs, we want to increase the flow of ideas, we want to increase the amount of information we're getting, how can we motivate people who actually, after all, don't make all that much money typically? Well, we can give them health care benefits for everybody. We can give them stock options for everybody and meaningful amounts of stock options. So that's what they decided to do back in the late 1980s. And when they went public, their investment banker said, you're out of your mind. Why on earth would an investor want to invest in a company that's crazy enough to give away equity to people pouring coffee? And so they called us and said, is there any research that shows this actually works? And we said, yes, yeah, matter of fact, there is. And so their investment bankers decided reluctantly to live with it. And that's turned out to be a reasonably good investment since... 1987. I'm not sure where it ranks, but I would guess it ranks in the top 10. And their turnover now is 60%. The industry is still 300%. Other companies started looking at that too. Companies like Whole Foods, for instance. They said, you know, we're going to manage this company in a completely different way than anybody's managed a supermarket before. Rather than having every store be exactly alike, with the same customer policies and the same products on its shelves and the same look of the store, we're going to organize all these employees into teams. There's a grocery team and there's a cheese team and there's a whatever. You know, you go to one of these stores and a team member from so on come here. Well, all these employees are organized into teams. The teams will have some say in how the store is laid out and remodeled and even the product mix that goes there based on the what they hear from their local customers about what they're interested in having. The teams also meet to set goals for themselves. They're given all the information they need about how the company makes money. And they're said, okay, what do we do on the grocery team to help this company generate more profits? 
Well, for us, the critical thing is shrinkage. I don't know what it is, but it might well be shrinkage. So let's have a goal of reducing shrinkage by X percent. And if we meet this goal, this is the reward we'd like. And they set their own goals and they set their own rewards with the only constraint being they have to publish them so everybody else knows what they're doing. The teams, each team elects someone to a store team, so the store-wide team from each of the teams. Store team has somebody going to the next layer, whatever it is, regional, divisional, all the way up to the corporate national office. So there's all these ideas that are constantly flowing back and forth. All this information coming up from the bottom as well as going down to the top. How important is that in any large organization, even a small organization? Robert Reich just wrote a really interesting article about the Bush administration. I don't mean this as a political comment, but purely as an organizational one. And his observation was that the Bush administration is terrific at getting elected because they're very on message. Everybody has the same message. Loyalty is the highest virtue. And that's great for winning elections. But it's a real problem for governing because when you appoint people and promote people based on loyalty and everybody being on the same message, how do you get the information that's discordant? How do you get the information that, gee, that idea maybe didn't work, that maybe the message we have on this particular issue isn't the right one, we should try something else? You don't. And what happens is information starts going up these hierarchies, and you don't want to tell your boss you're a bozo. You don't want to say that was a bad idea. So you say, well, even if you think it's a bad idea, you sort of gloss it over. And then it goes up another level. And it gets glossed a little more. And it gets glossed a little more. And by the time it gets to the top, it was a great idea. In the 80s, when I was starting the center, I worked for a company called Control Data. They don't exist anymore. And in our office in Washington, we had to come up with a, a report each year based on what we thought was going to happen. And nobody wanted to tell the boss that what we thought was going to happen in the particular area that we were working on was that the boss's idea was going to work. So you, 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 because you wanted to not be look too stupid, so you tried to sort of make it sort of look like it would work and sort of look like it wouldn't. Well, by the time we got back what, what they had heard at the top from what we had said, things looked great. And the company's projections every year were growing and growing and growing until it's what turned out not to be so brilliant market idea that PCs would never go anywhere, that the real money in computer was these remote servers that people would have uh, links to. I forgot now even what that was called. But needless to say, it's history and the company's history. So it's real hard to get that information there. So companies like Whole Foods are saying there's got to be a different way. Again, we're talking about big companies, but the same dynamic would apply in a company with two employees, where one's the boss and one's not. You have to have that kind of trust and openness between people so that you can really get the information you need to make intelligent decisions. And people have to be motivated enough so that they'll tell you in the first place. So these ideas came to fruition in the mid-90s in a number of companies. And we ended up with about 10 million employees getting stock options through companies that were sharing them with most or all employees. And these companies, too, were outperforming expectation. Productivity rates went up about 17% in the three-year period post adoption over what you would have expected if they didn't have these kinds of plans. Now, there's some pullback from that now because changes in accounting rules and shareholders getting mad about dilution. And so some companies are saying, do we really need to do this? If we can't give out as many options as we used to, well, we better give them mostly to our quote unquote key people because they're the ones who really make the difference. Now, of course, the stock market has a different reaction because it turns out that when companies announce that they're giving grants to most of their employees, stock prices go up. And when they announce they're going to increase the grants that are already going to CEOs, stock prices go down. But again, it's maybe that information disconnect that when you're the CEO, when you're the compensation consultant to the CEO, 
when you're the board of directors made up of other CEOs, it's real hard to say, no, you know, maybe you're not right about that. Maybe this model that we have, that if everybody else at the 50% level of compensation, we should be at the 50% level for CEOs, not for everybody else, by the way, but we should be at the 50% level at least, or maybe the 75% level for our top officers. And that's why that's a good reason to do that, and that's how a lot of compensation sets. So if everybody else is increasing options or other kinds of equity awards, which is what they're doing now, then we should too. It's a curious analytical tool, isn't it? Can you imagine the product acquisition manager who goes to the board or to his CEO and says, well, I figured out we should buy this $20 million new computer system. And the way I figured it out is that 50% of the rest of our competitors have it. And so if, ev if everybody else, or at least half the people have it, it must be a good idea, so it must work for us too. Well, you get fired for something that dumb. But if you say our compensation should be done because that's what everybody else is doing, that's fine. So the result of all this is some pullback, but not a lot. We, we might see a 20% pullback. But in the long run, I think you're going to see this continue to grow. And that's because the nature of business itself has changed. It used to be that a business could make a lot of money doing the same thing the same way over and over again. Any business, whether it was selling coffee or selling hamburgers or making jeans or making computer chips. For a long time, it was efficiency that drove a, corpora a corporation's profits. And so if you could find ways to do that same thing just a little more efficiently each time, that was a good system. And hierarchies were well adapted to that because they set up routines so that everybody did this exactly the same way day after day after day. Well, the world's changed. Now the emphasis more in companies is on effectiveness. That's a distinction, I think, a brilliant one that Peter Drucker has made between doing the right thing and doing the thing right. The emphasis now is more on doing the right thing. There are a number of reasons for that. One is that the diversity of products and services has changed immensely from what it used to be. And it used to be that companies could offer two or three or four products and pretty much the same thing over and over again. Now companies have many, many more products and many, many more services. When I was growing up and my mother took me to the athletic store, I could get athletic shoes, high top, low top, black or white. Those are my choices. Now if I want to go get a pair of running shoes, I go to a running shoe store and they ask me, do I supinate or pronate, run on trail, off trail? How much do I weigh? How much do I run each week? And then there are 12 shoes for me to choose from. Services are equally diverse. So now companies have this much larger number of things they have to deal with on that dimension. But not only is there more product and service diversity, but the speed with which things are changing is a great deal faster. The life cycle of these products and services is much shorter. If you do something well, somebody else is going to copy whatever you do very quickly. So new strategic ideas have a very short lifespan of competitive advantage. You not only have to do the new thing well, but you have to figure out the next new thing before your competitor does, and the next new thing, and the next new thing. And that's multiplied, remember, by this much wider variety of products and services. The third thing that's changed is there's a lot more information. The bank teller today on the screen has more information than the bank CEO had 15 years ago. That bank teller has an enormous amount of information about what that customer has done. And if that bank teller can look at that history and say, gee, looking at your banking history, I see that this would actually be a better product for you. How much does that improve that customer's relationship with the company and maybe sell that customer? on products and services that would never happen unless that bank teller had that information, had the training, had the motivation to do something about it. So much more information. Now, 
return to that old hierarchical model where information is moving up and up and up and decisions go down and down and down. It takes a long time. The information gets distorted. As decisions get pushed up, the more decisions there are, the fewer get made. It's not enough time to do all this. It's not an efficient model. So instead, you have to disaggregate decision making. Now you've got a lot of people making a lot of decisions about a lot more things more quickly. And if they're not simply going to make more decisions about more things more quickly badly, they need business information. They need to know how does the company make money? What does our income statement look like? What are the numbers that drive performance in this particular unit? And everybody needs to know them because everybody's involved in these decisions. They need a reason to care. Ownership is a great reason to care. But above all, they need a structure to do it in. Most companies say, we're an open, open door company. People are our most important asset. But nobody walks through the open door because it's too ambiguous. And management doesn't really fully believe that they're their most important asset anyway. And so, yeah, we want you to share ideas and information gets translated into if you feel like it. Whereas the really effective companies say, you have to share ideas and information because it's part of your job, part of what we expect from you. And so we're going to organize you into teams or cross-functional teams or work teams or self-managing teams or whatever kind of team we can think of. And we're going to say, here's your responsibility. You manage this. You do it. You figure out how to make money doing it. So as we move to that system, that system where people are really thinking and acting like business people, where people's ideas and information are pri the primary asset of corporations, and today over two-thirds of the value of publicly traded stock is, uh, consists of intangible assets, the intellectual capital that, com that employees are contributing, then who really owns these companies? What does ownership of the company mean anymore? Financial ownership? Does it mean who owns the bricks and mortar? The real assets are intellectual capital, the ideas and information that people are contributing, then the owners of those ideas and information are the employees, and they can take that capital and move it someplace else very easily. It's very liquid capital. So if those are the real owners, shouldn't they be the actual owners as well? Now, let me just conclude with uh, an example of how I think a company has done this in its most fully developed form. It's a company called W.L. Gore Associates. You may not recognize the company, but you no doubt recognize the product, Gore-Tex. When W.L. Gore Associates was created, Bill Gore thought that they should run things a whole lot differently than they did before. He didn't like working at DuPont. He didn't feel that that he was really treated that well. He'd come up with this product idea uh, that later became Teflon. And he didn't really feel like he got the right kind of ownership of that. So he formed his own company. And they were fooling around with Teflon. And it's one of those great stories of, the, you know, down in the basement we made a mistake. And lo and behold, we found that this plastic stuff that we had was uh, not water permeable, but it breathed. Well, boy, we can do a lot of stuff with that. So Gore Associates said, well, we're going to do things a whole lot differently. First of all, we're going to be an employee-owned company. In fact, we're not going to have employees. We're only going to have associates. Secondly, we don't think that expertise, that authority should be consistent with position. We think authority should be consistent with expertise. And expertise on any particular issue is going to shift. Third, we want people to take responsibility for their own work and not constantly have to check with us. We want entrepreneurs at this company. So they said, we're not going to build any facility bigger than about 150 because we want everybody to know one another. Because if they don't know one another, you're going to end up with hierarchy and bureaucracy. Secondly, we're not going to have any management structure, no titles, no reporting system. When you're hired here, you won't be hired for a job. You'll be assigned a mentor who helps figure out what it is that you might actually contribute to the company. 
Your pay will be based largely on a 360 review, and you'll have a pay champion appear to help argue your case for how much you should be paid. When a project comes up, it will come up because somebody has an idea. Gee, you know, we could use this Gore-Tex on dental floss, and it would be a really neat product. Well, you don't have to go get management's approval because there isn't really any management because there's no titles, there's no hierarchy. What you do have to do is go convince enough of your colleagues to join a team with you and see if you can actually do this. And if you can, then you can do it. And that's a really tough hurdle because you've got to convince a lot of people to stop doing what they are doing and join you and do that instead. Now, those teams will uh, sort of not elect, but the leaders emerge from this, so that you might be a leader on this project but not on another. And indeed, 50% of the associates at Gore say that they are leaders. And this is now a company of about 7,000 employees that is consistently named one of the best companies in America to work for. They were, they've been named the best company in England to work for for the past few years running. They've grown at 20% a year sales and profits uh, for about 20 years. And they've done this with a system that to everybody else looks totally chaotic. But if you ask them what makes it work, they say it's not chaotic at all. It's the most disciplined, demanding system you can imagine. Because nothing gets done here unless you can make an extremely good case to a lot of committed people that this is what we should do. But then if you can do it, boy, go and do it. And nobody's going to get in your way. So it's become an extraordinarily innovative company, an extraordinarily effective company, and apparently an extraordinarily good place to work. The last thing I'll say is that all this stuff is great. These companies make more money. The employees stay longer. The employees generate, it turns out, a great deal more financial assets through these plans than they would through conventional retirement and benefit plans, three times as much in ESOPs, for instance. But at the end of the day, when you talk to a lot of the owners of these businesses and you say, what really is satisfying about this? They say, and all that stuff you just said was great. I love the tax breaks. I love the productivity. I love the performance. But it was the right thing to do. What really makes me feel good is I did the right thing. I remember listening to somebody talk at a conference about 20 years ago, and he said, when you live your life, you want to think about what do you want to be remembered for. And very few people say, I don't want to be, I want to be remembered because I was really rich. I want to be remembered because people say, boy, that was a good looking guy. He had a big car. He had a huge house. People will want to remember you because what did I do for my community? What did I do for my fellow man and woman? What did I do for my family? And that sense of satisfaction is so much deeper and so much more important than anything else that you can achieve. That if it worked, you can say, I did the right thing. I provided an atmosphere that gave people dignity and respect, that there's nothing better than that. So if you go off and you create your own businesses, uh, I hope you'll keep that thought in mind because it's, it's the best reward that you could possibly have. So questions, comments? I'd be happy to talk about some of the technical, specific stuff about all this, too. Yeah? So where did you, you just utter once in this whole thing about the union? The, did, you, did any of them have you? Yes. In, uh, in, <laughs> in companies that have employee ownership plans are about as unionized as companies that aren't which isn't very unionized anymore. And some unions look at this and they say, we don't want to be management. This is a terrible idea. Other unions have embraced it. Uh, where you have very adversarial labor management relationships, the presence of a union and employee ownership doesn't mix very well because you can't get to that kind of cooperative, high involvement model. Where the union management relationship is more positive, then it builds on itself. And it's just another way to encourage it. And the best example of this is in the airline industry. 
Southwest Airlines is almost entirely unionized, the most unionized carrier in the industry. A lot of people assume that it's not unionized at all, but it's not true. And they've had an employee ownership plan almost since the outset. And they've, as everybody I think who's followed them knows, they've been an extraordinarily successful example of creating a different kind of workplace that has allowed them to thrive and at least now survive in a market where since deregulation, 198 carriers have gone bankrupt so far. Now, United Airlines, of course, famously had an employee ownership plan, but that very adversarial relationship between management and labor. And they did all these things I was talking about in the first year, and they did great as a result. They had all kinds of cost savings. People were enthused. At the end of the first year, they hired a new vice president for people, as they called it at the time. They got a new CEO, and the new CEO and the new vice president of people didn't like the idea of employee ownership. They weren't comfortable with it. The union leaders never were really comfortable with it, even though it had been their idea. They didn't like the idea of all this cooperation with management. And as soon as they could get back to the old ways of banging on one another's heads, they did. And they were much happier that way for a short time and then everything imploded. And they did basically everything you could do wrong with employee ownership, they did one of each. Yeah, but that's, that's a legacy airline. Yeah, I mean. Really, really the Southwest has one, air, one kind of airplane. Right. So everybody flies the same plane. Right. Only one thing, the maintenance guys all only learn one airplane. Yeah, right. United has 10 airplanes. Yeah, I mean, they do a lot of things right at Southwest. Same with Jet Blue, you know, all those. Right. Right. It, it would be wrong and naive to say that the only reason that Southwest has succeeded is because of its employee culture. But if it's, it's a big, big difference. A friend of mine once said that Southwest Airlines is the only airline that can treat you like cattle and make you like it. <laughs> and it's because employees there have a very different attitude than they do at the, all of the legacy carriers. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, yes. Good question. Right. Right. Very good question. There are a number of ways companies traditionally look at that, the startup companies. They'll say, okay, we're going to give ownership to each new employee in the company. And you'll have some cutoff criteria at the bottom. Well, you have to work here for a year, or you have to get to, you know, if you're a Wendy's, when they had everybody had options, they'd say you have to become an assistant manager. Well, that's not a very big hurdle in that kind of store. But there'd be some basic hurdle you'd have to sh cross that would show that you had some real commitment to the company. You weren't just sort of visiting. And the second thing they need to think about is what mechanism do we use to share ownership? Now, if you're a startup company, an ESOP's not the mechanism you're going to use. It's too cumbersome, too expensive. Lots of tax benefits, but you don't need any tax benefits. So you're going to look at something more like an individual equity arrangement. It could be a stock option, phantom stock, which essentially says they're not going to give you real shares, but the cash equivalent of share value. Stock appreciation rights, which say we're going to give you the value of the increase in the company. Um, there are different mechanisms. Restricted stock is another approach. But all of these are mechanisms that say you individually can have a piece of the equity value of the company. And you have to look at the different tax issues. And that's kind of a mechanical assessment of what's going to work given the demographics of your company. The, third thing you have to look at is how much ownership do we give away? And that's a much trickier issue. Traditionally, what we hear from startup companies is somebody will call and say, well, I'm comfortable with 10% of the ownership. That, that seems okay with me. If you have venture capital investment, they may say, we're comfortable with this level. And they'll want you to share ownership with other employees. They may even require it, in fact. 
and they may have their own thoughts about what that level should be, and there's some give in that. Intuitively, that makes sense. You say, here's a level I'm comfortable with, but it runs into some real problems over time. The first is, let's say you say 10%, but I want to give it all away right away, because what if we get a little bigger, and I, you know, then I've got the next person, and I've already given away 9%. So you say, well, maybe I'll give away 5%. And then you get bigger than you thought you would. So now, you, you're right, you've got this 10% this ceiling. You're bigger than you were. You're hiring people at maybe even higher levels than you were. And you're saying, I'm sorry, I can only give you 1,000 options, although our person who actually is now below you is getting... 2,000 options, which, by the way, are more valuable because they were granted at a lower price. But you see, I can't give away more than 10%, so I'm kind of stuck. So there's an alternative way to look at this, and this is, we'll call it the Beister model. And the Beister model said, it's not important what percentage of the company I own. It's important how much the value of that company that I own is. So if you say, okay, to the group of six people who join you to begin with, here's our target for the year. If we meet this target, then I'm comfortable with giving you X percent of that target, 25%, let's say, and pick some number that you're comfortable with, 25% of that target in the form of equity in the company. Because when, you know, if you're at this level of sophistication, you figured something out. If your target is, say, profitability, and you increase your profitability by $100,000 over your target, and you have a price-to-earnings ratio of 10 to 1, so if you give away 25% of that, you keep the 75%, and that's worth $750,000 in equity follow what I'm saying? Because the price to earnings ratio is 10 to 1, and you've created another 75,000 in earnings. You've given away 25% of it, but gee, you've ended up with a whole lot more than what you started with. So now you're at this new level, and you get some more, you have to hire some more people. Well, you can do the same deal with them. If we get to this level, then here's the deal for you. Now, when you try to figure out well, how much should that be, you need to pay some attention to what people expect they're going to get in terms of what the competitive labor market is. And I don't think you should simply say, let's go for the median. Now, there are lots of surveys, and they're useful information, but every company is different. Every compensation package has different elements. There are different rewards to working for different companies that aren't compensation-related. So use that just as a sort of general idea. You need to be in that ballpark, but you don't need to be right at the 50% median either. And so that helps you figure out how much of this increment do we give away. And boy, if we do a lot better than this increment, you'll do even better than that median. Everybody thinks, well, I can help you get to better than average. So they're, you know, they're, they're going to see that as a pretty good deal. And you can just keep doing this ad infinitum. The other thing that that accomplishes is that from the employee's perspective, you help eliminate two basic problems. One is the entitlement effect, which is, gee, I got these, uh, you gave me all these options when I came. I don't get any more options. So all I've got to do is, as AOL once said to me, rest and vest. If there's always more out there, there's always more to get. The second thing that it does is it's, very, it's much more motivating to people to go for targets. We love to play games. You know, you can go up to Reno, and you can do this for four hours, and you, you'll lose, but it's really fun because it's a game. But if you go up to Reno and I say, I give you 50 bucks, do this for four hours, win or lose, nobody would do it because it's boring. This is the same thing. And most jobs are this after a while. What makes them interesting is the game attached. So if you can say, here's the game, and you have scoreboards, and you keep sharing these numbers, and you make a big deal about it, it's very motivating to people. So that's a, to me, that seems like the most sensible way to do it. And some companies do it that way, many more than used to. I mean, when, 
when we started sort of preaching this message over our company, said you give everybody however much ownership they're going to get when they start. And uh, now the shift is more to parceling it out over time, par and increasingly based on performance targets. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Shareholders like that too, by the way, because if you're an investor in these companies, you can say, okay, I'm willing to give up more if we grow more. And from the investor's standpoint, one of the interesting things is there is an asymmetry in how they value current costs versus future gains. You may have seen all this work that Daniel Kahneman has done, but is that a name people know? He's a behavioral economist at Princeton, won the Nobel Prize. And he's done these kinds of experiments where he'll say, I've got $10, and I'm going to give it to the two of you but you have to decide how to split it. So here's the deal, five and five. Great, we'll each take five. Uh, how about this deal, six and four? Uh, I don't know, okay. How about eight and two? No way! I'm not getting two and he gets eight. Well, that means neither of you get anything. But most people won't take that deal. Similarly, if you say to people, okay, I'm gonna You've lost $500, double or nothing. See if you can get your $500 back. Most people will take that bet. You've won $500, double or nothing, you win 1,000 or zero, most people won't. These are exactly comparable economic scenarios. Now, imagine you're an investor. What behavior does that lead to? Protect your losses be much more concerned about your losses than giving up potential gain. Uh, neoclassical economists and traditional investment models assume that that's just total hokum. But in fact, that's the way people behave. And so if you say to investors, would you rather give up a dollar in cash as compensation or the potential that we've measured through a Black-Scholes model that says this is worth a dollar of potential future gains, they're much more likely to take the dollar of future gains deal. So this sort of, that sort of dynamic approach works for everybody. It also eliminates the lottery effect, which is you happen to go work for the company at the right time, so your options are worth a lot, but then the company did well and you got options up here, and then it didn't do so well, so your options are worthless, and the guy working next to you is doing exactly the same job is really 